the seven stages of growing in confidence. Number one, love. To have an experience of the love of God, knowing that we are loved unconditionally. Love first for who we are, and only second being loved for what we've done. This is expressed so clearly by St. Paul who said that God loved us and died for us even while we were sinners. The second level of growing in confidence is knowledge. All of us long to be known and all of us long to be understood and to experience and to know that God knows us and understands us even better than we understand ourselves. Because, you know, it's one thing to be loved, but it's a whole other thing to be known and to be understood. Just like, you know, you may have people in your life who love you, and those who really know you and understand you, that's really reflected in how they love you. Even the simple things like, you know, those people in your life who just know what gift to give you because they know you, they've paid attention to you. And so it's great to be loved, but it's way better to be known and loved. Lord, you have probed me, you know me. You know when I sit and when I stand, you understand my thoughts from afar. You sift through my travels and my rest with all my ways, you are familiar. Even before a word is on my tongue, Lord, you know it all. I know when I was first coming to faith, um, one of the things I learned was that, or I was being taught and I was trying to understand was that we can trust the Lord with anything. There's really nothing for us to be afraid of. And you could give things over to the Lord. And it took me a while to figure out what that meant. And what really amazed me was I would give things over to God. Sometimes I would have a specific request. And often I didn't say, Lord, I just place it in your hands. And I was so amazed at how the outcome of something was amazing. The outcome would be, some, would be something that could only be choreographed by someone who really knew me. I'd have things work out in a way that, that I couldn't have asked for better that because God knows me better than myself, I'm thinking, gosh, that's an even better outcome. Thank you, Lord. And that's how we can experience this practically. But this knowledge goes two ways. It's possible for us to know God. Jesus says, I don't call you servants anymore, but I call you friends for I reveal to you what I'm doing. In the Old Testament, God says, you know, I don't do anything without revealing it first to my servants, the prophets. And guess what? You're that prophet. And what's very cool about this at a practical level is, you know, when you, when someone reveals to you what they're doing, it really builds trust. So for example, maybe you've had, you know, like a really, really good manager and he kind of gives you the inside scoop on what's going on in the company. He says, look, this is, you know, if you're wondering why we're going, you know, going in this direction, or if you're wondering why we're doing this, it's because of this. And that really builds trust. You know, imagine if you, you know, you knew the leader of your country personally. Wow, would you ever, would that ever build trust if you kind of had the inside scoop? And so that's a whole new depth of love and a whole new trust we have in God. But one thing that's more important about knowing God more than what his plans are is knowing his character and knowing that he is so good. You know, we read in the Gospels that, you know, what good father would give his son a stone if he asked for bread or a scorpion if he asked for a fish? How much more does the 
Father in heaven give you good things. So for example, like there are times maybe where you've had a boss and you know, your things are going on in the company and he's like, he's not able to share what's going on. He's not able to give you the inside scoop. He says, look, I would love to tell you, but I can't. You're just gonna have to trust me. But if he's a boss who's demonstrated his goodness and his character, if he's revealed his character to you, go, okay. Even though you can't share, I trust you because you are so good. And I've experienced this in very, very difficult circumstances. Um, I was kind of going through a renaissance period of understanding the goodness of God. And whenever I would encounter something that was difficult, I'd say, God, you are so good. And somehow in saying that and reciting that, even as a mantra, it would stir up faith within me. You are so good. You are so good. And one time I went through a breakup in a relationship, and this was a gal I'd really, <laughs> I'd really fallen hard for. And, you know, when I kind of got the background on why she didn't want to move forward, it was super hurtful. It really, yeah, it was very difficult to kind of hear the feedback. And yet, just knowing this goodness of God, I just actually was able to heal from that rejection very quickly because of the goodness of God. He's so good that I could trust him even, you know, even with the future of my love life, which kind of looked bleak after this experience. One of the things also about God's character that's taken me a while to get a handle on is that God is happy with me. If if I'm in the state of grace, then I know that God is happy with me. Now, if, I would, if I'm outside of the state of grace, the Lord loves me and he's prompting me to get back into this friendship and relationship with God. But for some reason, I always felt that God was just a little angry with me, just always kind of a default state of not being pleased with me. But I think now when it, with my own kids and my sentiment towards them, and I'm really, you know, faulty as a father, it's helped me realize how much God is pleased with me, just so happy with me. Yes, he wants to move me forward from where I am today. I think one of the ways I kind of came across this was I, I remember hearing a preacher say one time, sort of, you know, in kind of, with a sense of humor, he said, hey, you guys, guess what? God's in a good mood today. And my default reaction was, no, he's not. And that uncovered something in me that I needed to kind of pray about. Think, no, no, God is in a great mood. And God is happy with me as I stay in this state of grace. But if I'm not, he's happily trying to get me back into it. So, Growing in this confidence of God, I feel like it's almost like three steps. Knowing that you love me is great. Knowing that you know me is even better. But adding on top of that, knowing who you are is best. The third stage in growing in confidence is dignity. You know, you could know that God loves you. And you could know that he knows you and knows the inside out of you and that's going to affect how he loves you. And knowing him and his character is amazing. But even after that, it's possible that you may not, you still may not feel special. Well, that's the third stage. You just go, I know that I'm special in the eyes of God. Not because of anything I've done, but just there's a dignity that I carry. There's just something special about me. Because of what God has done, it's because of our relationship with God that we're special. It's a gift he's given us, but the bottom line is, growing 
in this level of confidence with God is coming into this sense of this great dignity that I have. The fourth stage of growing in confidence is entitlement. Now here we're not, we're talking about a good or a positive sense of entitlement. An entitlement that comes to us because of who we are, because of what we've been given. But it makes sense that flowing from a love and then a knowledge and then a dignity, it only makes sense that we would have a good sense of entitlement. Now, this sense of entitlement means two things. First, it's an authority. God has given us an authority. It has pleased the Father to give us the kingdom. One of the best verses that helped me kind of come into this is, you know, if you had the faith the size of the, a mustard seed, you could say to this mountain, go into the sea. And it was a real turning point for me when I realized that Jesus means that literally. Like if you had the smallest of faith, you could pray with authority and pray a prayer of command. And, and in other sessions, I'm going to share examples where I've prayed a prayer of authority either for healing <laughs> or sometimes with inanimate objects. And I've seen God move through this delegation he's given us, through giving us the kingdom. He's literally delegated his authority to us. This is part of the entitlement we have. And it's an amazing thing. And it's one of the first experiences I had of his, his authority. But the next level of entitlement entitlement is it is the notion of inheritance that there's things that God wants to give us because we they are owed to us which is kind of an amazing thing but as as being daughters and sons we have an inheritance now the fullness of that inheritance of course is heaven where every need and every desire is met. But even in this life, the scriptures speak to us getting a down payment of an inheritance, getting a first installment of an inheritance. So many powerful scriptures for this. Has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom? He promised those who love him. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your Father has chosen gladly to give you the kingdom. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or fields for my sake will receive a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life. So yeah, we're seeing those inheritances, that inheritance speaking to the life to come, but not just for the life to come, but even for today. And he has identified us as his own by placing the Holy Spirit in our hearts as the first installment that guarantees everything he has promised us. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. And so today, we receive a down payment of this inheritance in a couple of ways. Practically, through the many, many gifts that the Lord gives us. Like there's so many things today that God has given me that are well beyond what I would have expected. And so that gives me so much hope when I see a lack, when I see what I experience between what I experience and what God has promised but it gives me so much hope because of the things he's already given me. But even in those situations where I'm experiencing lack, often what that lack I'm experiencing is something largely, even on the inside. And so what does God do? He gives me the down payment, the first installment, which is the Holy Spirit which gives me so much hope for the future. Because many times we're in situations where, you know, we, what we long for, that promise, that inheritance we long for, 
yeah, we can wait, but it's that angst that we feel on the inside that, the, that God pacifies and blesses us with the installment and that of the Holy Spirit. Number five, an advanced level of growing in confidence is a change in our motivation. We go being motivated from the gifts of God to God himself. And we see this so powerfully in the parable of the prodigal son, where we see one son who prematurely asks for his inheritance and squanders it, but then returns to his father and says, like, I'm not even worthy, you know, to be your son anymore. I just, I just want to be part of the family again. And the father restores him to his complete unequivocal dignity which symbolized between the robe and the ring and the sandals and yet the son who has been faithful to him all this time um, is not um, is not happy for this even though this is the maybe one of the happiest moments of his father's life the son is not interested in participating in that as a matter of fact the son is only asking, hey, there's things that you've just never given me. The older son, who's been faithful, is only interested in what he can get from his father and is upset that the father hasn't given him everything that he needs. So we see the older son being motivated out of the gifts of the father, out of the love of the gifts of his father and not the love of the father. And yet ironically, the son who has squandered his inheritance is returned, is now motivated out of the love of the father. And so we actually see a greater maturity in the son who returns and who is motivated out of the love of God. So an advanced level of growing in confidence with the father is what is our motivation. Even in the, the church's teaching, the church will talk about two forms of contrition two forms of repentance. They'll say an imperfect or an immature repentance is turning away from sin because we're worried about the consequences, you know, the loss of eternal life in more serious cases. Where perfect contrition is that we're sorry to God because he's awesome and we wouldn't want to offend him who's so amazing. The sixth level of confidence is freedom. The sixth level is so powerful because once you know you're loved and you know that this source of love knows you and so the way he's going to love you is amazing but because you know him he's awesome and that leads to just a sense of being special which leads to a sense of entitlement which then transforms your motivation when you get to that place you're truly free you're free because you are loving because you have been loved first. You're not tied to what, what the outcome of that love is. You've been loved, so in turn, you want to love. And so that is a state of freedom, complete freedom. But this is one of the things God wanted us to have. This is why Jesus died, for the sake of freedom. And then this leads us to our last level of growing in confidence, and that's responsibility. We now take action with this motivation we have to love God because he loved us first. We then translate that into action. We're ready to lay our life down, not because God's going to give us something, but because he's already given us something through the identity we have in him.